let us say a very good morning to Mr. Peter Hitchens. Peter, good morning. Very nice to see you. Lovely to see you. On too. this auspicious day, uh, I was regaling you earlier of how useless the trains were on Saturday. I, I'm, I'm sorry for repeating this story. I'm going to keep saying it. The idea that you can't get a train from Waterloo to Putney on a busy Saturday is extraordinary to me. Yes, bring back British Railways. It's oh, the only thing to do. Just renationalise oh, it. We well, that's right, but they've got to be renationalised properly as British Railways. Yes. With the fat controller and everything. It's got to be done. It's got to be done. And can we have the union leaders back as well? Well, I'm not they were great so fun. sure about... What was, it, Le, was it Len um, somebody? Oh, well, there was Sid the Wheel, railway guy? Sid Wheel, there was Ray Buckton. Those are the ones I, I, I dealt with yeah. mainly. I can't remember who... It wasn't Len McCluskey. It was Len somebody else. But anyway, we'll get back to that. There's always a Len. There was there's, Len Murray of the TUC. There's Len, that was it. That's what I was thinking of, very much so. Um, well, let's talk about uh, what you kicked off your column with, and that was, of course, um, the uh, result in Northern Ireland at the election on Thursday. It is now clear, even to the dimmest, that the IRA have won in Northern Ireland, is your line. Well, that's the thing. I get this stuff all the time, and I say, look, in 1998, what this country signed was a surrender agreement uh, yes. to to the IRA. And people say, no, 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 the, the IRA were losing the British one. So in that case, uh, how, how is it? It has to resort to sarcasm. Uh, how is it the IRA were forced to accept the release of all their prisoners? <laughs> how were the IRA, for, how was Martin McGuinness forced to, to, to dress up in white tie and tails and go for dinner at Windsor Castle? Yeah. Uh, how, no, and, and how, how is it that the, 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 the British government, which supposedly won, then withdrew all its troops mm. and dismantled all its surveillance yeah. equipment and the, 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 the Northern Irish Police Force, the IUC was disbanded. Yes, and renamed. Re re well, re no, not just renamed, but replaced by a wholly different and much more politically mm. corrected uh, body. Mm. Uh, the place has changed. The, the union. No, not forgetting the, as well. Union we're... Jack barely is allowed yeah. to fly over there now without special permission. Yeah. It's not. And if you look at the cap badges of the police, they do not have the crown no. of St. Edward on them, which is the symbol of authority right. in this country. They have a sort of a sort of uh, monopoly version crown yes. and a monopoly. And not only did crown. they release all the terrorist prisoners, but they then started prosecuting uh, people who were in the British Army. Uh, for sort of war crimes. Oh, that's right. Uh, this, this, and the idea that this is some kind of victory, people go on and on about appeasement. I can't get people to shut up about appeasement here and appeasement there. But one of the biggest incidents of appeasement in the modern world is the appeasement of the IRA by Britain and mm. also, I have to say, by the United States in 1998. Yes. But we can't call it appeasement because, uh, because then we'd have to admit that what we did was give in. But this clearly, yeah. this agreement, which almost nobody has read, mm. and you can make yourself immediately a distinguished expert by reading it, because <laughs> everybody you know will not have done so, right. has said for years that the, that the, 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 the will at, at a time of, of, of somebody's choosing be a referendum on whether Northern Ireland uh, is, is actually transferred to the Republic of Ireland yeah. and that referendum if it goes in favour of that will be irreversible mm. but if it doesn't go in favour of it it can be held again every seven years yeah. until it does so it's obviously a one-way ratchet yeah and that's that was a, a key part of the agreement and I think this will come and I think the although we all know that the what's happened with unionism in Northern Ireland is that it's split yes. and is weak which is why Sinn Féin is, is, is the biggest party the reason for that is mm. unionism has nowhere to go right. What all the all the loyalists are suddenly discovering that the people they want to be loyal to don't want them. The British government has not, for many many years, wanted to rule Northern Ireland. Mm. They'd much rather hand it over if they could get rid of it. And people who want to be British are just being told by the British government, "Sorry, Buster, right. uh, you can't be." And it's sinking in with the Northern Ireland Protocol, where yes. you actually have Northern Ireland well, on the far side of a customs barrier. I mean, the the inaction by this government on sorting out the Northern Irish situation with Brexit and with the EU would suggest that they don't care, that they don't they want don't it care. to be sorted never, out. John Major said back in, in, in the 1990s, Britain has no what he called selfish interest in Northern Ireland mm. anymore. What he said was, we, we don't want to hang on to it. The, the problem is that the people living there want, want, want to stay British, and that, mm. that has been the problem. Now they're so divided that they probably lack the power to do it. Yeah. But it's, what is undoubtedly the case is that, is that terrorist violence won, and the, the governments, both Conservative and Labour, which go on and on about how dedicated they are to the fight against terrorism, actually gave into it yeah. when it confronted them directly, which means, as far as I'm concerned, that all the, everything they ever say about the subject should be dismissed mm. as blathers. Well, that's right, because when they talked about, you know, we can't have, possibly have a hard border between uh, the Republic and Northern Ireland because that would lead to violence, it's such a ludicrous position to hold. Well, does that mean you give in to every terrorist organisation? Well, it, it, it's a, it was a bizarre thing to say anyway, because the, the 1998 agreement said nothing about the border. It wasn't about it. Right. The, 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 what there was of the border at the time, the, the effect that it did have was that the surveillance, the military and intelligence surveillance of the border, 
uh, and the, the, the enforcement of it as a security board mm. uh, gradually was dismantled. Yeah. But in terms of it being a customs barrier, it hadn't been one for ages. No. And uh, it was the, never going to The old customs posts on, on Dundalk and Newry stations no. had, been, uh, had, had been rotting away for years. And that's the there. point as well, isn't it, about the, the, the passage of goods into Northern Ireland. Almost none of that goes any further than the border. It doesn't go into the Republic because they have their own transportation links. No, but if you, if you aren't careful, I'll, I'll start on about, uh, about why we should have, have taken the Norway option, which would have avoided all that problem anyway. But well, yeah, I that, don't, that don't may be anybody, for another anybody day. Anybody wants to hear that anymore? Yeah, well, I think no. I think it's going to be an important conversation because I think the thing that people get wrong, and I've, I've had a lot of conversations over the weekend with a lot of barristers who have said, you know, everyone's misinterpreting this almost as if they deliberately want to misinterpret it. Yeah, we'll you know, the it. Sinn Féin win is not a win. They had the same number of uh, seats as they did last time, 27. You know, it's just because the other parties have fallen away. It still means that you're left with a first minister from Sinn Fein, who surely will be absolutely and utterly campaigning for a united Ireland. Or you'll get, or you'll get the death of the of, of the whole power sharing agreement because yeah. the unionists will never allow any first minister from Sinn Fein to mm. take office. So that will stop, mm. which will of course increase ultimately the the, the the tension. And then there's the other thing which everybody forgets is the huge boost which surrendering to the IRA gave to Sinn Fein. Yeah. In, throughout Ireland, mm. and Sinn Féin is now rapidly moving up the charts in the Republic of Ireland as a major party, yeah. and there is a big danger that it will replace Fianna Foil. And at that point, of course, you have the the possibility of a United Ireland run by Sinn Féin. Yes. Uh, well, that again is the fruit mm. of the of, of the nineteen ninety. And you and I are remember. both old enough to remember the bombing campaigns in the nineteen seventies, in particular. I mean, I was very close to the one in Holland Park where the cancer surgeon got blown up because uh, I went to school there. I walked, literally walked past it, and the explosion happened when I was about five minutes down the road. My mother was five minutes from the Harrods bomb, and if it hadn't been for me sleeping in with a hangover, she would have been in the shop. You know, so we all have a story. Oh, no, it was going on all the time. Yeah. You, you would be you would be going home, and, and you'd hear a great bang, and yeah. you know what it was. And all this, stuff, everybody says, that, oh, they gave warnings. Well, if they did, they well, often they, didn't no, get well, through, no, and they, they certainly they're not in time for people uh, wholly innocent people to be blown mm. to pieces by. It was a ruthless... It was horrible. Campaign, but it was also extremely successful. Yeah, and absolutely right. And also the, the fact that Dominic Raab's in some of the papers this morning assuring us all that this will not have any effect on the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland does not fill me with joy. <laughs> as soon as you hear it... You know, <laughs> but, uh, that, I'm that, just grateful he knows where it is. Government statements. <laughs> OK, just keep that. Put it in an envelope. Keep it. Yeah, absolutely so. right. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, Vladimir Putin. Today yeah. he's having his Victory Day parade, um, something you've attended in the past. Well, yeah, I so it, it wasn't when I first lived in Moscow, and still the Soviet Union. Uh, it was much more of a day of celebration, where all the old geezers, they were still alive then, uh, uh, quite a lot of the veterans of the Red Army who'd, who'd, who'd fought their way to Berlin, mm. would, would be indulged, and you'd see them in the streets singing and uh, having a bit, bit too much to drink yeah. and, uh, and wearing all their old medals. It was rather yeah. touching. Mm. Uh, then it replaced, eventually, uh, the, the great parade which used to take place, the Revolution Day parade, celebrating mm. the, the great coup d'etat of 1917, used to be held on November 7th, and that ended when communism ended in 91, and I saw the last of those in November 1990. And then they began to make Victory Day a, a very big thing. Yeah. And it certainly looks pretty... Impressive. Well, it is. Right I mean, Red Square is an impressive, one of the most impressive squares in the world, I mean, with St. Basil's at Cathedral mm. at one end and the Kremlin Wall down the other side. It's an enormously impressive space, and if you run troops across it, it looks good. And, yeah. uh, but the fact is, it doesn't con really conceal from anyone who knows it the truth that the Russian armed forces aren't up to much. Mm. And in fact, I was looking up when I went to have a look at one of those parades 14 years ago, I think, looking up what I said and quoting experts saying, look, the Russian army is not any better than it was. It's still pretty useless. Yeah. It looks good on the square, but don't imagine this means it's actually going to be performed very well if it ever fights. Mm. And this is all borne out. I've been saying it for years, all this stuff about Russia being a huge military threat isn't actually true. I think when, we, the, when the whole thing began, I said that the Russian army was, was different from the Soviet mm. army in that it was less drunk. Yes. Uh, but that was the only right. concession. And certainly there was talk, wasn't there, that he would want to have finished uh, in Ukraine and declared victory in Ukraine by this particular day. I don't know where that comes from. Yeah. I've searched for it. I, I'm, if anybody can provide it for me, I'd be interested to see it. I'm constantly told that the, the, the objectives were set, but I don't know when they were set. It might be. I don't even know what their objectives are in Ukraine, you see. I don't know what it it's is. It's not clear, is it? Do. I mean, I it's almost as though if you were told that it was a purely a PR exercise for the people of Russia to think that, that Putin was the man, you might even believe that. 
Oh, well, of course, because it, 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 it's, it's true both here and there that uh, everybody who relies on, particularly on television and the main newspapers for what they, mm. for, for what they know about it, is getting a more or less one-sided diet. And it's all very well, well for us to say that the Russians are being given a one-sided diet, but so are we, honestly. Yeah. And you very, very seldom hear any analysis which gives any, uh, any weight at all to anything mm. which the Russians say. It's an absolute mystery to me which needs to be solved is here you have the Ukrainian armed forces, which frankly are not much better than the Russians and also smaller, who are now performing with such fantastic brio. Yeah. Uh, wh how has that happened? Well, not only and they are more questions not asked about how this this, yeah. this, this, this raggle taggle force of a corrupt country has suddenly become so good at what it does. Yes, and also not only are they performing, but you too flew in uh, yesterday to Kiev to do a special performance for them as if they haven't suffered enough. Angelina well, Jolie has been said, have, have they not yes. suffered enough? But I mean, <laughs> it, it's obviously not that dangerous. I don't think Bono's that keen on going into uh, war zones. But, uh, Peter, let's talk about Julian Assange. First Very of all. quickly, I would say again, uh, it's nine days now until the Home Secretary has to make her decision on whether to extradite Julian Assange. If you don't want this to happen, I do very strongly urge you to write politely and briefly yes. and soon to her uh, the address I frequently give it on my Twitter feed okay. uh, at the Home Office to say, please do not extradite Julian Assange. The time is running out to mm. act on this. And if you don't feel afterwards that you should have done it and you didn't. No. I mean, it does seem ludicrous, doesn't it? Because the other thing that uh, just uh, off to the side of that, and it's not, obviously nowhere near as important, but Boris Becker being in that prison, where they're now threatening to deport him when he, can, when he comes out. And you kind of go, I mean, there's a lot of things wrong with the justice system in this country. Julian Assange being held in a prison of high um, detention level when he hasn't actually been found guilty of anything. Boris Becker, a white-collar criminal who's being held in a horrible prison in Wandsworth, I think it is, uh, and they're now talking about kicking him out of the country when, you know, there's an awful lot of other things going on. The, but there is, a, there is a bizarre logic in it, but, yeah, I, it, it, is, it, it is odd. Some, perhaps we should uh, devote some time to discussing the criminal justice system I think we should. sometime soon. I think we should do that. Let's talk a little bit about grammar schools, though, because you remember... Yeah, again, well, uh, I, I've just uh, delivered the manuscripts of a book on the subject. Uh, which I'm afraid that the research that I, that I undertook, if research it can be called for the book, uh, made my heart sink. Mm. I, I, I used to think that there was, a, there was a serious possibility that we might get grammar schools, state selective mm. secondary schools of good quality, which, which actually allowed people from poor backgrounds yeah. to get really good education. I thought we might be able to get those back. I'm now pretty convinced we never will. And mm. one of the main reasons for that is that the ultimate profound hostility uh, towards grammar schools of the Conservative Party. And we know about the dogma dogmatic hatred of them on, on the left of the Labour Party, which has been so yes. triumphant. But the Conservative Party played a huge part in destroying them. And I always knew this, but I didn't realise just quite how useless and actively useless they'd been. Mm. And it's a great shame. I, the, they did so much good. You know, they only they actually did. I last, went to one. It lasted as, 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 a, as, as state schools really for not much more than 20 years. Yeah. And during that time, they transformed the country. Uh, I, I, I asked a colleague of mine to go through a recent who's who and find all the grammar school people in it, scientists, uh, distinguished civil servants, judges, uh, pe people of great achievement in all walks of life. Mm. And the numbers are extraordinary. And after 1965, all that began to come to an end, and it's all the public schools yeah. again. And it's such a well, I have stupid say, waste. I must, find, I must say, I mean, my, both my sister and I went to, uh, to grammar schools, Catholic grammar schools in, in West London, and um, during the 80s, 1980s, when we were first sort of starting to look for work and stuff like that, the Big Bang happened. Britain was much more socially mobile then than it is now, I'm not. I think. Yeah. No, but th what's happened? I mean, the, the Sutton Trust, uh, 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 Peter Lample's outfit, have done research on this, mm. as, as I teach first. So they come to the wrong conclusions from it. But the, the, the best comprehensives, which I have to say are nothing like as good as the grammar schools used to be, mm. are incredibly socially selective. That is to say, they have very low numbers of children from poor backgrounds. Yeah. What do you have in this country is ruthless selection for secondary education. It's all done on the basis of wealth. But for those 20 years, just for a very short while, it was done on the basis of talent. Mm. And a huge reservoir of talent in this country, which had been untapped for centuries, suddenly found its way to the top, and then the lid slammed down shut on it again. It's the most extraordinary yeah. tragedy. I wish I thought it could be reversed. And do you think the ideology behind getting rid of them was so sort of single-minded that it was almost that was the one thing if they, if, they, if that was, if they, the only thing that they could leave office having done was to rid the place of grammar schools that was it well it was a belief that, it, that society would be more equal and more democratic if if they had comprehensive schools it was basically so they were just wrong it was just supposed to be a copy of the american high school system mm. it was wrong but here is the thing it's been clear that it was wrong 
pretty much since about five years after it got going. Yeah. But will any of these people admit their mistake? Say it was wrong, go back on it. Right. You cannot get it to happen. So many mistakes were made in this country mm. in the late 50s and early we 60s. Still make it. And, we, and we continue to make them. And the people who made them will not recognize that they made the mistakes. Mm. And they just won't put it back. And it's quite extraordinary. Because what you've got now is, is a Labour Party, actually, which is probably, I haven't seen the figures, but I'm sure has got many more people who went to private school. Than, uh, than there were in the past on, on that particular side. Well, it might well house. be so, but of course that option is being closed now mm. because the, the fee charging schools are becoming so expensive. Yeah. And at the same time, the great universities are discriminating against them. So mm. the advantage that people used to buy from going to them. Mm. And so people are more and more trapped in a comprehensive system, which is the enemy of promise. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and actually it has, has caused uh, not merely the schools, but the university system to reduce hugely the quality of education. Mm. Here's an incredible thing. When I was growing up in the late 1950s and early 1960s, it was commonly said that a set of English A-levels were worth the same as an American college degree. Mm. Who would say that now? No. But there was exactly. a thing called the brain drain. The Americans were constantly spending vast numbers of dollars recruiting people from this country yes. who, they, who were educated to a far higher standard than their own schools could manage. Mm. Gone. And Scotland is even worse in my Well, Scotland had very good selective schools. They, they, but they, they were, did have a much better system than they, they had have a good, now. They, they, they certainly did. They were much more interested in educating mm. children uh, uh, from an earlier point mm. in England. They had a very good system. And they trashed it in, in a very short time. There's no surviving grammar schools in Scotland at all, or their equivalents. Mm. Slightly more complicated up yeah. there, I went into that. And they're, they're, they're brilliant things, as we had down here, called, called they were called um, grant-aided schools yeah. up, up there, which were, were private schools which took uh, good quality yeah. pupils from all parts of the state system. And these were destroyed as well. And now, of course, the, so, so private education has taken over in, in, in Scotland in a quite shocking way, it seems to me. For, Scotland is a much more egalitarian culture than Britain, mm. and it's really quite odd to see a country of that kind uh, having, having actually resorted so heavily to private education. Yeah. I mean, I always said one of the things about living in Scotland and having both Scottish parents was that the great thing about Scotland is it didn't have the same class structure. No. It didn't have the same snobbery value for certain no. things. Everybody was kind of on the same level, and the only people that you would have called different were the English who went up to the hunting lodges at the weekends to shoot grouse. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, what, I'd certainly a more a more generally egalitarian country than this. It's, it, it's bedeviled with fewer class problems for yeah. certain. But uh, that was something which was was made worse by the by the abolition of selective secondary state schooling, and it, it has been everywhere. But to get anyone to recognise this, mm. I mean, I've, I've done so many debates about this, and increasingly I find that the left won't even debate it. No, they don't don't even want well, to they don't like to debate anything that they think you might disagree with them on. Really, well, where, where you might beat them on is more Well, I think that's probably true as well. Well, listen, um, it's been a fascinating time. Who knows whether Sir Keir Starmer will make it through the week? Um, what's your view of all of that nonsense? Well, I hope he does, because I don't think people should, should lose office for this. There should never have been these stupid laws. Yeah. Uh, which should the, the ridiculous thing is, of course, that both Johnson and Starmer helped to make the yes. stupid laws, right. which have made them now look silly. The the lesson from this is not that Johnson and Starmer should resign because they had a beer or had a piece of cake or mm. didn't. It's that they should they, they should admit that they made a terrible mistake. And as I've said many times before, they burnt the house down to get rid of a wasp nest. Mm. And there's so many prices we pay for this. And one of the first things we need to do is for all the people involved to admit that they made a terrible mistake and they haven't done it yet. And unfortunately, I'd say, adding to that, that they promise never to do it again, but their promises aren't really worth very much. So. Well, the problem is when it comes round again, there'll be a new lot of ninnies. Yes. Uh, who are not bound by that promise. <laughs> How depressing. Peter, uh, you've managed to make me smile, as ever. Peter Hitchens, thank you very much indeed.